Welcome to the Terran Space Academy. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and support us on Patreon if you can at patreon.com slash Terran Space Academy. We wonder about what is possible. We dream of leaving the Earth and exploring the solar system. Authors and artists have beautifully depicted these possibilities in ways that inspire us. To make these dreams a reality, we have to ask ourselves, what is the limit of propulsion technology? What is the best possible propulsion system? Welcome to the Terran Space Academy. We are working hard to prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and support us on Patreon if you can. We always appreciate your feedback and comments. In our studies, we have reviewed courses on many different types of propulsion technology. We've looked at the simplest rocket engines using cold gas and monopropellant thrusters. We have looked at more complex and efficient rocket engines, like the bipropellant Saturn V, the space shuttle main engines, and finally, the world's first operational full-flow stage combustion rocket engine, the Raptor by SpaceX. The limits to the efficiency and power of the designs are determined by the combustion pressure and temperatures of the fuel and oxidizer and the heat resistance of the engine structures. Rocket engine efficiency is measured in specific impulse seconds. How many seconds can a unit mass of fuel balance the force exerted by the Earth's gravity on a unit mass of payload? For example, how long could one kilogram of fuel levitate one kilogram of mass against Earth's gravity? The most efficient rocket engines ever built were the RS-25 Space Shuttle main engines, burning hydrogen and built by Aerojet Rocketdyne with a specific impulse in vacuum of 455 seconds. We discussed the low density of hydrogen and the need for massive tanks and very cold temperatures, making it hard to work with. The Saturn V F1 engines used RP-1, or refined kerosene, much easier to work with, but the specific impulse was only about 265 seconds at sea level, while the second stage was hydrogen fueled with a specific impulse of 421 seconds. SpaceX has compromised with methane fuel in the Raptor engine achieving a specific impulse of 380 seconds in vacuum. Methane is much denser than hydrogen and burns much cleaner than RP-1. These engines are limited in their combustion temperatures and pressure by what the metal alloys of which they are composed can handle, aided by active cooling systems where cold fuel is pumped around the combustion chamber and nozzle. How can we make more efficient rockets? The rocket equation tells us that the change in velocity, or delta V, is determined by the exhaust velocity of the propellant from the rocket engine. If you take the specific impulse and multiply it by 9.81, you should get the exhaust velocity. Now the exhaust velocity is determined by the temperature and pressure in the combustion chamber if it has an appropriate throat and nozzle. The force exerted by the engine is determined by the amount of propellant that can be cycled through the engine in a given amount of time, something we call mass fuel flow, times the exhaust velocity. Current rocket engine technology requires that for every kilogram of payload we want to put into Earth orbit, we will need about 20 kilograms of propellant. So only about 5% of a rocket will make it into orbit. The Delta Heavy is the most powerful hydrogen-fueled rocket in use today. It has a mass of 733,000 kilograms at liftoff and can get 28,790 kilograms into low Earth orbit. This gives us 3.93% mass to orbit. The SpaceX Falcon Heavy is the most powerful RP-1 rocket in operation today. It has a mass of 1,420,788 kilograms and can get 63,800 kilograms to low Earth orbit. This gives us 4.49% mass to orbit. Finally, the Starship burning methane should have a liftoff mass of about 5 million kilograms and be able to get at least 100,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. 
This gives us only a 2% mass to orbit, but it has the advantage of being completely reusable. And the Starship may be able to get 150,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, giving it a 3% mass to orbit. The choice of methane as a fuel appears to be the perfect balance between fuel density, where RP-1 wins but has coking problems, and energy content, where hydrogen wins but has low density and requires massive tanks. The Raptor engine on the Starship operating at 300 bar has about 96% efficiency in converting the energy potential of the fuel into propulsion. Elon Musk is hoping to improve that to about 98 or 98.5%, which is approaching the thermodynamic limits and has a specific impulse, as we discussed, of 380 seconds. This will be perfectly adequate to throw large amounts of mass into low Earth orbit. There will be incremental improvements, but this will be as good as it gets for chemical engines until we develop metallic hydrogen fuel, and that may be a long time down the road. Now we have covered ion engines where the propellant is stripped of electrons so as to have a charge and then these ions are moved through and ejected from the engine at high velocities. These engines are much more efficient in their use of propellant than the chemical engines, often having a specific impulse of about 5,000 seconds, but they are not energy efficient. The best of them only converts about 70% of the energy input into efficient propulsion and that energy has to come from somewhere. The chemical rocket makes its own energy by burning the fuel and oxidizer in a combustion chamber. The ion engine does not. You have to find a way of providing electricity to it. This can be solar, but then your available power is limited by the efficiency of your solar panels, which is on average about 15% today, with about 40% being achieved in the laboratory. And the amount of solar power available to your ship depends on your distance from the sun. Spacecraft operating around Venus, which is 0.72 astronomical units from the Sun, will have almost twice as much power available per square meter than a ship in orbit around the Earth or Moon. At Mercury, which is 0.4 astronomical units from the Sun, that power will be 6.25 times more than what's available at Earth lunar orbit. This could be a very effective power and propulsion system for ships operating between the orbits of Venus and Mercury. But even if we get solar panel efficiency to 90%, which may not be possible, a ship operating at the orbit of the Earth would be limited to about 1,200 watts per square meter, giving us only about 120 kilowatts for a 10 meter by 10 meter panel. There's also a severe limit on how much propellant you can ionize in a given period of time and process through an ion engine. This is the main limitation of ion engines. The amount of electrical power needed to ionize and accelerate the propellant is very high, while the amount of propellant they can process is very low. This limits their thrust. Despite their efficiency, even if we used a nuclear reactor to power our ship, these are not high thrust devices and could only lift us off very low gravity worlds like the Moon, Ceres, and Titan. Where can we get more power? We can go nuclear. Fission reactors have been in operation for about 70 years. If we apply this technology to space travel, we could use a nuclear fission reactor to power an ion drive. But most reactor designs have a lot of mass. And the ion engine, remember, has a very limited mass propellant flow. This high mass low thrust problem means that it might be a good choice for long duration missions like Earth to Jupiter when compared to chemical engines, but not that good for shorter trips. Another application of fission energy we have discussed is the Pulsed Neutron Thermal Propulsion System. This engine used radioactive materials like uranium or plutonium to produce a powerful pulse of high-speed neutrons. The neutrons strike hydrogen propellant and flash heat it to a temperature actually higher than that of the engine itself. It can pulse as fast as 10,000 times per second with a very high mass fuel flow producing tremendous thrust with a specific impulse of at least 1,500 and maybe as high as 5,000. This is the only advanced, high-efficiency, high-power, high-thrust propulsion system available with current technology. But it is also limited by the thermal energy absorbed by the engine itself and the capabilities of the alloys of which it is composed. But what about fusion devices? 
We all hope that MIT succeeds with the spark reactor, or that lattice fusion, described in this course, is proven possible. But what if we did have fusion? What if the spark reactor works? It has the potential to produce 100 megawatts of power, but needs 50 megawatts to operate. There should be no problem getting the reactor working smoothly on Earth before launch, and then allowing it to power itself, producing 100 megawatts and consuming 50 megawatts for a net power output of 50 megawatts. But what if a ship lost power in space? Where would we get the 50 megawatts necessary to get it started? And that's a lot of power. A Tesla power pack produces 3 megawatt hours of power with a mass right about 2,200 kilograms. The mass of a power pack system to produce 50 megawatt hours of power would be about 37,400 kilograms. This isn't too bad, actually. One SpaceX Starship could be placed in orbit with three fully charged 50 megawatt hour power pack systems capable of producing a total of 150 megawatt hours of power. It could stay in low Earth orbit and jumpstart three spark fusion powered Starships before exhausting its charge. Now a Starship is 50 meters tall with a diameter of 9 meters. Assuming Earth orbit at 1,370 watts per square meter and 40% efficiency, we get about 240 kilowatts of solar power if one entire side of the Starship is covered with super-efficient solar panels. The solar energy harvested by the solar panels on the Starship gives us around 625 hours of charging time. This is 52 days, considering that half your orbit is shaded by the Earth. So let's have 75 megawatt hours of battery capacity on each of these starships with its fusion reactor. So if we have to shut down the reactor in space, we can restart it. This would give us a buffer of emergency power to operate the ship while the reactor was down. Now that we have a fusion starship, what could we do with that 50 megawatts of power that it produces? Let's assume that we'll use some for ship power, but surely not more than a megawatt hour. We talked about the propellant mass flow problems of ion drives. They can't process enough propellant mass to develop high thrust. What about the electrothermal rocket engines we saw? The only engine we examined in our lecture, seen here, capable of producing relatively high thrust was the Vesemer engine. The Vesemer engine is not just efficient with a variable specific impulse, hence Vesemer, between 1,500 and 5,000 seconds, but can also produce quite a bit of thrust. Nothing like the pulsed neutron drive, but still considerable and without radioactivity. Could this type of drive be improved? The Vassimer drive is ridiculed by some as a propulsion system because it requires so much power as to be impractical for most applications until you get fusion power. Then this becomes the only viable design. The reason I say this is because this rocket engine is not limited by the temperature of the propellant. Usually you have to make sure that you don't melt your engine, limiting heat production to less than the melting point of your engine alloy. Considering active cooling systems, this is about 4000 centigrade. The Vassimer engine can heat the propellant to about 1 million centigrade. The Vassimer design should become more efficient with increased size. And if updated with the superconducting Rebco strips developed by MIT for the Spark Reactor, should be a very capable space propulsion system. The secret to the Vassimer is that it uses a magnetic field to keep the superheated ionized plasma from contacting the engine materials. Can we use this type of electromagnetic confinement in a different way? What if we have a fusion reactor providing power, then ionize helium-3 and put it into a chamber? electromagnetic fields to hold it in place, then fire powerful lasers or microwaves into the chamber creating fusion and just letting the superheated fusion products flow out the back of the engine. This would be a true fusion drive and would have tremendous efficiency and thrust. We see ships like this in the expanse where some form of fusion creates enough thrust for them to fly through space at an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared giving normal Earth gravity on your journey. Now, scientists have calculated the amount of fusion fuel necessary to produce that much thrust for a trip from Earth to Mars, and even with fusion drives, the math doesn't quite work out. 
but it's otherwise a wonderfully accurate depiction of future space travel. Can anything beat fusion? Only antimatter. If we could produce and store antimatter, we could beat the efficiency and power of even a fusion drive. If we only burned one milligram of antimatter in our reactor, we would be able to produce 90,000 megajoules of pure energy. And this is the limit of power density in our universe. The antimatter drive would allow recreation vehicle sized interplanetary spacecraft that could take off from the surface and lift sedately to space, flying directly to their destination. Until we develop a Higgs field nullifier or warp drive, this is the ultimate space propulsion system. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.